There we go. Uh, thanks for taking the time to chat with me. I really appreciate it. No, my pleasure um, as always. I've spoken to Jim a few times. I thought we might mix it up this time and get a different perspective on the Caligula's horse uh, formula. Uh, sure. So, so how's it been in the Caligula's horse uh, club camp so far this past few years? Well, I mean, it, it depends what year you mean, because yeah. you know, things things have sort of changed by yeah. yearly for us. But uh, I mean, not to not to get too protracted on you know on 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 the first question, but we we, we struggled a lot through the pandemic. Like you know, we we were mm -hmm. one of those bands who didn't necessarily. Well, I think of a lot of kind of like Northern European bands who sort of got government funding were able to really focus on music in the time, whereas we sort of had this battle, like both internally and externally like, again. You know, one just trying to stay alive through the pandemic, work yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And two, that sort of weight of expectation, as we call it, like you know, the fact that at some point we didn't have to follow Rise Radiant up, even though we didn't really get to live with Rise Radiant. So the pandemic period was pretty, pretty rough. But from this year, from the beginning of this year, when we sort of went back to touring and stuff, it's it's been wonderful. We've we've sort of reconnected with what you know we do and who we are. Um, and fortunately, we've got an album to show for it, even if it was a bit of a struggle to get to. Yeah, and it seems, especially for Caligula's horse, I don't know, I've always gotten the impression that you guys really thrive off of live energies, right? You always see photography and video from your shows, and, you know, it seems like you really appreciate that direct communication with your fans, right? So much so. Like, I, I've said to a couple of people that there's this, there's a sense that you don't really know the music that you write until you get to see how it interfaces with the crowd, you know? Mm, yeah. Um, like, uh, you know, we obviously spend so long when we create new music for a record, both writing it, pre-producing it, performing it, all of that kind of stuff. But there's this final element that you get to learn just by playing it to an audience and seeing what happens, you know, seeing which parts kind of have a, a unique feeling to them or elicit a certain response from the crowd. And we never really got that with Rise Radiant, you know, like we, we well, until this year, at least, we never really got to add that final layer of understanding to it. But yeah, we, we are absolutely a, a live band. That's, you know, it's, as you say, where we thrive. Which is maybe, maybe a double shame because I think like Rise Radiant is such a, um... I don't know, it's a very emotional, impactful album, right? Um, In Contact is still my favorite Caligula's horse, and I, I listen to it every single week at least at least once, but there's something about Rise Radiant that is more condensed and, and direct in many ways. You've, you've, hit the, you've hit the nail on the head. Like, Rise Radiant was an album that we very deliberately wrote on the back of all of this back-to-back -back touring that we'd done in the years leading mm. up to it. Like, In Contact was obviously very exploratory, and it was sort of the first concept album we'd written since the very beginning of the band, when Jim and I were still kind of working out our collaborative um, partnership and, you know, the, the, the process that we take. But Rise Radiant, we we deliberately wrote with the stages we were playing in mind. You know, like we sort of saw our profile rise throughout the In Contact period. We really enjoyed that. And it was almost impossible for that to not filter then into the creative process and into how we create music. So you're right. It is mostly a little more condensed. It's a little more austere is kind of a weird word to use because a lot of it mm. is still very layered but there are a lot of songs on rise radiant that really kind of pull back the layering and all of that stuff with the intention of it being something that feels a bit more like a direct representation of our band of course there's an irony in me saying that's chuck or grace the newest album is kind of the opposite of that <laughs> once again but uh, i would to... use i would use austere to describe the, the new album right rather than Rise Radiant. I feel like it's even more still. I just realized you can't see because I took it down uh, to yeah. clean, but I have a Rise Radiant poster that is usually like yes. hanging above this library. And awesome. I just realized awesome. that we can't see it. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I ask this for every single artist that I interview. I ask this um, about um, eras or like periods in your career and, and whether you see it the way that I see it. Because looking back, and maybe it's anachronistic and I'm just reading into it, but it's really mm. almost like you have a pattern, right? Like you release a concept album and then a more song-driven, energetic album. So you have the debut, then you have Thief, then you have mm. Blue, then you have In Contact, then you have Rise Radiant, and now you have the new album. Um, mm. Like, is that something intentional or is it just the way that things kind of shape up? I love how you pick out these things, Eden, because you're exactly right. Like, I mean, it's to, to the point where it's actually a very deliberate thing. Um, not necessarily the jumping back and forth between like concept and song oriented, although that has absolutely happened to be true. It's really more that we take a very deliberate um, approach to, 
contrasting our previous work. And that mm. tends to sometimes manifest, you know, as you say, in these kind of archetypal approaches to albums. Like I, I, I would very much agree with that assessment. But it's 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 mostly about beginning the process with a kind of brainstorm. Um, where we try and decide what the direction of the album will be. So in the case of Rise Radiant, like I said, we we obviously had a big concept album preceding it, but then we also had this experience of the stages we were playing and the kind of knowledge of what works live, uh, even if it's a kind of subconscious knowledge. Like, you know, we're not deliberately trying to paint by numbers to make it work live. It's more just that's where we're that's that's where we currently are as artists. Um the exception to that is actually, funnily enough, probably Charcoal Grace. It yeah. still acts as a, a, a kind of um, a, like a contrast to Rise Radiant. But the big difference is that it was an album that we didn't actually have a very simple brainstorm beginning. It actually took quite a lot of work to start writing it and to sort of come to terms with what it would thematically need to cover and need to kind of like, quote unquote, be about. Um, but no, you're, you're bang on with that assessment. I think it's it's a perfect reading of it. So, so that's interesting to hear about Charcoal Grace and because like, I've been trying to, I, I, I received the album like a week ago and I, I started listening mm. to it and digging into it and I started trying to maybe unfairly uh, situate it in, in relation to the other albums and it mm. felt like it had more in common with In Contact. Well, first of all, there's the, the running themes of paint and ink and so on that, that kind of tie both albums together. And when I spoke to Jim, we spoke about his words that he likes um, that he keeps His using, power words, he calls yeah, them, exactly, yeah. yeah, spit and and ink and and so on. He really likes like the plosive yeah. sounds and so on. But then also in your playing and the composition for the album, mm. I could hear um, many similarities. But then also things from Thief, you know, more of the intimate kind of guitar playing and storytelling uh, coming to the front. It, 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 could I say that Charcoal Grace almost feels like you know a hybrid of many of these different approaches and in, into something mm. new? I think it is in in a sense like there, there was a well actually let me let me start at the beginning I suppose because I, I think I can give it a bit more context by kind of explaining a little bit more that background that led to it. Um, as I said, we struggled through the pandemic. Like we we definitely hit a couple of points where the band was really you know hanging on by a tether, like where where we could have broken up if things went worse, just mm. because we were so disenfranchised by kind of both our experience in the band and the experience that we all had as a global community, seeing what happened through the pandemic, like just seeing that kind of breakdown of you know communal aspects and discourse and whatever else. It was yeah. uh, it, it was a pretty weird time to be an artist in that sense, and it was definitely something that sort of affected us um to the extent of well i i felt like i was in a kind of writer's block mode for a good mm. chunk of 2021 22 and it wasn't necessarily like it was a kind of internal writer's block it was really more just that i didn't know what an artist was meant to do in this time you know so the beginning of the album was really just trying to work out what we could say or what what was important to us and it follows that you know necessarily we needed to situate the album's themes in the experience that we all had so once that became obvious and we got over that initial hump, the album started coming together. But the big contrast that I feel with this album, as opposed to um, a previous work, is we didn't have the limitation. Actually, as I say limitation, I don't know if that's exactly the right word, but we didn't have the limitation that we usually impose on ourselves of always making sure any dark subject matter has a kind of glimmer of hope attached to it. Yeah. It's really this characteristic that I think is may be somewhat unique to our approach only because it is quite deliberate you know whenever whenever we explore dark things we try and make sure that there is a dramatic counterpoint to those um not because there's any kind of ethical reason to do so more because i think drama and emotion and expressivity tends to work best when you've got two contrary kind of points yeah, you know with contrast. Forth. contrast exactly yeah. right um but because of the nature of this album and because of where the themes came from it increasingly proved to us as we as we were writing that it was disingenuous to try and dig into the hopeful when the hopeful really wasn't that evident in, the, yeah. in that time. Yeah. So we allowed ourselves to kind of wallow a little bit more, like you know, dig into the deeper, uh, darker, um, and perhaps in in a lot of senses, like kind of less savory elements of the world that we were exploring in that record. Now, in saying that, like that being the case i think it definitely bears the closest mm -hmm. to contact, as you say in contact does have some of the darkest material we, we'd worked uh, with up until that point but i think we went quite a bit further with that in terms of the themes in this album 
And obviously that gives it a character all its own. But I think, you know, you could definitely look at different songs on the record as sort of embodying the approach that we've taken on certain songs in the past, you know. Something like Golem wouldn't be out of place on Rise Radiant or even Bloom. Sure. Like that, you know? um, Storm Chaser maybe is a bit more Bloom-esque. But I, I think by and large, the way I characterize it is it is a little more dark and a little more introspective. And those elements... Um, you know, I guess hybridize with everything else we've done to hopefully create something that feels somewhat unique in our catalog. That's always the goal. That's, you know, why we do the, the contrasting approach. Yeah, for sure. Interesting. So so pivoting pivoting away from that into some other stuff, this is a question that I ask. This is actually maybe a, a prelude question, right? Like, you know, I was just thinking about Caligula's Horse and where I would situate you in, in your career right now. Right? Mm. You're obviously, you've enjoyed a lot of success and growth over the last few years but it's still so I, I was gonna ask about inside out and how it feels to be on inside out um and i was gonna say that i always ask up and coming artists but you're not an up and coming artist right i would say you're already established right but it may have end, been pre-pandemic i'm not sure <laughs> yeah yeah it could be yeah that's true so like i'm looking at the roster of inside out and i'm just thinking what how i would feel to be on that label as a progressive music fan how, how do, how, what do you like to to be on that label well, I, I guess two 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 things to say. Like it, when when we signed with Inside Out, they obviously had a fantastic roster. Even then, I mean, many of you know my historical favorite bands, biggest heroes, Pen of Salvation, Devon Townsend, all of those kinds of guys. Yeah. Obviously, they signed Dream Theater kind of a little more recently, and even bands yeah. like Carpool and stuff. They they are quite simply. Well, I, I would say the roster is quite simply the best roster in progressive music, in my opinion. I, yeah. I, so many of my favorite bands exist within the kind of ambit of Inside Out. But um, our experience has been utterly incredible. Like we 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 re-signed with Inside Out at the beginning of the pandemic. So, you know, Charcoal Grace is the first album um, in our new deal with them. In other words, you know, we're, we're obviously happy enough in our experience to just keep working yeah. with them because it's been wonderful. And you'll probably notice that most of their roster that's true for, you know, the bands like Pain of Salvation and stuff have been with them for decades. Decades, now. yeah. Um, our experience has been incredible. It's, it, it's, it's incredible because, you know, the whole... The whole organization of the label really is not just lip service, but really is interested in kind of what the band wants to do and what mm. the particular approach will be this time. I think it's probably, well, maybe, maybe some people would be surprised to, to, to hear an artist self-consciously say it, but I mean, Charcoal Grace is not a commercial record in any way. <laughs> Rice Radio is a lot more, you know, of yeah. that kind of approachable. Record. Yeah, approachable is a really good way of putting it, totally. But yet, um, you know, the, the label absolutely loves it and loves the direction we took and the ideas that, that, that are behind it. So I guess that's kind of just a, a, a microcosmic way of, say, of sort of exemplifying what the label and our relationship is like. They want us to be honest to ourselves, And that's actually one thing that I, I, I constantly, uh, it constantly comes up as a talking point with uh, with Thomas, the, the head of the label, you know, whenever I'm self-conscious about something, it's usually me communicating with, with these guys. Whenever mm -hmm. I'm self-conscious about something, it, it usually sort of comes out with, it usually ends up with, well, is it honest? Is this what you guys want to do? And as long as the answer to that is yes, they're as excited as we are, which I feel is that's probably- fantastic. Yeah, I, look, I haven't signed for a million labels, so I don't know. <laughs> it's, like a very, uh, it's a very constructive kind of way of doing things, you know? Yeah, you know, I, I think with veteran labels, it, it, it really, um, it's like flipping a coin, right? Some of them yeah. are, as you mentioned, and I've heard a lot of stories about really veteran labels that are very, you know, uh, supportive and so on, and then others that are basically devolved into some sort of distribution business, and it's not really about vision or anything. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, I'm a huge Inside Out fan. I've been following Inside Out for um, years now. I realized that, like, I thought they, when I started listening to Inside Out releases, I thought Inside Out had been around for ages, but I've been listening to Inside Out for 20 years. So I've been listening yeah. to Inside Out for the majority of its existence, which is uh, really oh, funny no. to think about. Uh, I'm getting old. Uh, but moving on. Uh, <clears throat> so, what about, so, you know, I'm looking at the Inside Out roster. And mm. of course, there's bias there because they're in the UK. But like, can you educate me a bit about the role of like progressive rock and metal in Australia? You know, Australia generates a few big bands every few years, mm. but it's usually mm. not in the progressive spaces, right? There's a lot of like groove, death metal, and hardcore and stuff like mm. that. So, how did these artists, you know, you said you grew up listening to Devon Townsend. What's like the Devon Townsend fan community like in Australia? Is it a few isolated people or is it like a more of a common thing? What's the deal over there? 
I'll tell you something funny. Look, I've actually written academically about this, like in my mm. sort of other life as a yes. <laughs> academic. Like, I do actually find um, the history of a, like Australian um, underground musics, like you know, whether we're talking about kind of hard rock or metal or whatever, I, I, I do find it uniquely fascinating because, as you as you hint at. It is a bit of a strange place to sort of come up as a band, like both both in a practical sense, you know, in the fact that we have a couple of very um, geographically distanced cities with hubs and really very little in between. And the fact that we have you know, relatively a very low population as well, spread out across this huge landmass. Um, my experience coming up was that I really wasn't aware of a whole lot of that. You know, I I was always friends with at least a couple of people who had similar tastes in music to me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I feel like I was probably always the um, kind of explorer of music in my groups, at least until I kind of hooked up with um, a lot of the Brisbane progressive scene, which is where I met Jim way back in the day and sort of where we hit it off. But um the thing is, I, I feel like the experience is probably one that most of us have, but it has an element attached to it that I, it may be different than what uh, people overseas, let's say in places like the US and Europe, where hubs are a little more clustered and you know it's a little bit easier to find people into the same taste, which is that you do tend to be an explorer foremost. Yeah. And as a result, because you are you know maybe looking for things outside of your circle and um, that in conjunction with the fact that you know you live in Brisbane, a thousand kilometers away from Sydney, bands who come up tend to have less of an inclination, I think, to follow the trend that surrounds them. So th this is sort of my theory on why, let's say, like all of the big prog exports in Australia right now sound totally different. Yep. Like compare a band like Neobla Viscaris to Pliny to us, you know, we're all like you can make an argument orbiting the same progressive metal kind of like hub, you know, maybe, maybe not, but I think it's a fair generalization for the moment. Um, but we all came up with, you know, well, maybe we all came up with some shared influences, but we didn't have the pressure to kind of conform to what other people were doing in our hub and in our scene. And of course you do get people who imitate, you know, the bigger bands in the scene, but given again, that geographical um, uh, kind of, distance yeah. it's pretty rare for all of the bands that actually make waves in the scene to feel like they are you know multiple waves of the same incarnation of a style or something like that it's, all, it's so, almost I mean, like a, like a lack of evolutionary pressure almost right you have more space to explore and you, you come up against imitations um less often because the space well, is there. I, I would argue the evolutionary pressure is probably different like it's more of a kind of convergent evolution like we all mm. you know we all come up listening to the same artists but we don't listen to each other so where does that lead us in all of these spiraling trajectories of style but i think the biggest part and the thing is i've, I've mapped this in like australian metal particularly in its history like I've, I've written a couple of things on this i think there's also just this element to australian culture the kind of larrikin culture that we tend to be pretty um pretty resistant to external sources of coding like if if you know if, if death metal is meant to sound this way quote unquote you better believe that the australian versions of that will be laughing yeah. at that concept and doing their own thing you know we have this very inbuilt kind of rebellious nature i think just as part of our australian culture and i think that's true like i i mean i i didn't explicitly think that when i was you know forming caligula's horse but i definitely had a sense that i didn't really care what people told me i should do i would just do what i want to do so it was certainly to some degree true also of us and i reckon that's um that's probably something that lurks under the surface of a lot of um a lot of australian uh, underground music that's super interesting because it's something that you know, I, I'm I'm wrapping up a decade with Heavy Blog, so I'm now yeah. in this like nostalgic retrospective mood. I'm writing up like a decade in review. I'm looking back, and I'm very interested in subgenres that disappear and how it yeah. happens. I look at power metal, for example. Right, power metal. People don't understand how big power metal really used to be, and it's still big. You know, Blind Guardian still sell out every single show they ever put on, but mm. the, there aren't many other bands like that. And another genre that kind of maybe, maybe didn't vanish is Gent. Mm. And, and I'm looking at Caligula's horse's journey. Well, Thief was, I don't know if it intentionally, but ended up getting marketed in like the Whisper networks as mm. Gent mm. adjacent. 
and, and no, and I remember you, seeing that and, and and being a bit confused by it. But no, it's totally. Yeah, and, and I mean, you you might not have intended it, but the tone on on your guitar playing, especially on that album, is very you know chunky and and uh, um, staccato and like kind of feeds into the conventions of that sub style. Yeah. Um, and now it's gone. Right? Mm. It, it just vanished. No, no one self categorizes as gent anymore unless they're doing it ironically or like sort of a revival well, thing. This recent album, yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> like, and it's not been that long. Right? It's mm. been um, just uh, just over 10 years, and already we're seeing a revival of something needs to die in order for something to revive. So, mm. I was wondering, like, what your thoughts are. Um, you know, Bloom might also still belong to that sound in a way mm. it has a, a few like of those chunky kind of choruses and so on but then in contact and beyond kind of moves away from that sound it, mm. so you said you were surprised and it, what was your relationship with kind of like that categorization what did it do to you to be categorized in that like subgenre it's a, it's a really it's a really cool question like i i distinctly remember the the kind of underground again quote unquote progressive metal movement around yeah. that 2011 2012 2013 kind of period like when when our band was getting started and i remember at the time seeing you know like misha monsoor's early stuff obviously animals as leaders like all the bands that were kind of coming out a little bit before we did but you know in that same kind of period at least on all of the forums and things that we all frequented at the time um and I remember thinking even then that, you know, we, we were all listening to the same bands. Like, I love Meshuggah. I go way back with uh, Sixth, you know, all of the kind of prototypical bands. Like yeah. it's, in, it's the first wave of um, quote-unquote gen. But the thing is, I th th there were certain elements that never really stuck with me as an artist, like even at the time. Probably the main one is, um, again, I, I love Meshuggah, but I... I, I I really crave tonality. Like for me, one of my favorite elements as a kind of composer is harmony. You know, like the way the way chords work. Like forget melody, forget rhythm, forget the other elements. I just love the way you can create an atmosphere with harmony. And I think with a lot of that prototypical gent, that was almost deliberately absent. Like it was kind of the one element that you didn't really hear much of. And as a result, there was always a bit of a distance between kind of what I was doing and what was happening there. Even though, again, I was caught up in that. I was listening to a lot of what was happening around me. I was listening to the same influential bands. And, you know, th there's definitely a lot in those first two records, especially where that was the kind of guitar tone I was going for and everything, as you say. But um, I think the thing is, like, uh, with, with that with that limitation in mind, like the fact that I could never really get into stuff that was absent of harmony, just didn't do much for me, as I became more confident as a composer, uh, you know, as I, as I had a stronger sense of like, you know, what I was trying to say and what I was trying to do, I guess everything in my um, timbral and tonal and textural approach tended to rally a little bit more around that kind of harmony and melody first concept. So yeah, I agree. I think, you know, my guitars become a little more kind of smooth and fat and it fits a different kind of role in the in the mix and in the orientation of the, the arrangement. But um, I, the thing is, I've got a kind of fondness for Gent, like to come back to the original question. Yeah. I've, got, I've got a fondness for that era because it feels like the era when I was coming up. And I think mm -hmm. of all of the early bands, I like, think the more underground stuff like bands like After the Burial and stuff like that. You know, I, I, I learned heaps from those guys. Like I really did. They were, they were you know, I guess a, a generation older than me, I suppose, which is four or five years, let's say. But <laughs> yeah. it's, it's enough that they were influential when I was at a very sure. you know, important point point in in my own development so you know i'm kind of glad that music's become a little bit more um broad and smooth and uh textured but there was something kind of special about that early 2010s sort of gent movement i think last question so <laughs> i said in contact is is my favorite caligula's horse and i stand by that um mm. but tie the thief in the river's end is where i found you like so many other uh, fans, especially in our like space, um, so it's a two-part question. One, where does that album stand today? How do you feel about it? It's still mm. it's very primal, I would say. Right, it has one one leg in the debut, and then one leg in what's to come. Right, it's totally. kind of like a watershed moment. Opeth pun not intended. Um, <laughs> and then <laughs> the second part is just something I was thinking about right before we jumped on. Are you thinking about playing it in in its entirety? It it feels like it does. It's been long. Next year will be ten years, right? It, it was released in two thousand fourteen, if I remember correctly. 
Yeah, it was 2013, I, I okay. think. So this year it was 10 years. Yeah. So that, that's something that bands do, right? They go back to concept albums and they play them uh, end to end. Is that something that's ever cost, cost your mind? So we did actually play it in its entirety um, in Australia for, oh, for just cool. a three-day tour. Um, I forget when we did that, but we, we paired it with Bloom. We did both albums in their entirety. We did two oh, cool. sets, an interlude. Um, and it was... It was incredible. Like it was one of those experiences that probably meant more to me than I imagined it would, which probably could, uh, tie back to discussing the album a bit more generally. I suppose, like in contact. Uh, sorry, Rivers End was definitely the album where we worked out what we were trying to do. It's still prototypical. There's still elements to it that don't land perfectly, in my opinion. But when I go back and listen to it, I can hear Jim and I writing it butting our heads against one another, fighting over every part. Like it was a real struggle to write. But at the end of the writing for that album, I think we kind of came out knowing who we were as a band. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, everything got so much easier after that. Like, you, you know, talking about it as prototypical, I feel like you could probably, you could probably look at it as prototypical in many ways. Like it was um, sonically prototypical. You know, it's a sort of the, the general approach that we took um, for albums since. But it was also where we set our artistic process and where we got a sense for, um, you know, just sort of how we work together, how, how, how we engage Jim and I as, as the collaboration team behind the music. But um, when I go back and listen to it, the thing that jumps out to me is it's quite audacious. Like, it's a record... Yeah. You know, I, I know at the time I, I was I hoped it would be the best record that had ever come out because of course I was an early twenty year old. <laughs> you know, what what did I know? Like I, I yeah. what that really meant. But I remember releasing it to an entirely disinterested world. Like, you know, we 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 put our best foot forward and we definitely overestimated how many people cared at the time. And I remember being kind of crestfallen by the fact that, you know. Not many people bought it and not many people listened to it. And we just kind of kept chugging along as we did. But what I love about River's End is that it, it's such a cult album for us. Mm -hmm. Like We still hear from people now who discovered that album, maybe not even in 2013, you know, maybe discovered it in the years since. And they still describe it as their favorite album, even as they've kind of followed our career onwards, because it is, it is audacious. It is like a, a very... Um, uh, I feel like a, like a surprisingly coherent, given the period of our career, a surprisingly coherent representation of what we were trying to do. It's got this dark narrative. It's got this exploration of a lot of themes that we were really interested in. It's got a lot of musical ideas that I think became much more confidently placed in our music since. You know, take something like Atlas and its kind of major chords or um, or uh, All's Quiet by the Wall and the way that it kind of threads a motif throughout the whole song, but very subtly. Like, these are all things that I still do now and hopefully do better with more confidence. But listening to that first example, it just feels very brash and very brave. And, I, you know, I, I really enjoy that element of it, even if I was a kid and I didn't really know what I was doing to the same degree that I do now, you know. For me, there's this like a quote unquote problematic thing that whenever I hear graves, I want to go back and hear all is quiet on the wall because those epic you can hear graves in all is quiet, right? That, totally. that ma massive riff and so on kind of like echoes um, each other. I think it's very interesting in contact and in River's End. It's it's weird that I call it Fief. That's like the shorthand for me is Fief and not River's End. Some um, people call it, yeah, yeah that, that's like the two albums that I keep uh, going back and forth with. And I think there's a lot of interesting i could maybe rewrite this interview and we just talk about that like the interesting contrast between those two releases there um, are. yeah i appreciate your time uh sam thank you for, for chatting to me uh by the way um i'll see you in boston oh I'll wonderful be, i'll be at your boston date i said this on record because i know we have heavy blog people in boston so if anybody's listening to this and they're planning to attend caligula's host boston show then <laughs> give me a shout and we can uh, meet up and oh, have a good time awesome and and come say hi i'm sure we'll be sort of floating around afterwards and whatnot um cannot wait to play yep. boston the u.s in general absolutely it's gonna be yeah great. I, i'm looking forward to it um i've never seen you on like a pop or tour right i saw you at the festival it's not the same so yeah. i'm looking forward to like a full caligula's whole set it's Big gonna be a blast up. All you know, whole back catalogue of songs. It's gonna be. That's gonna be so much fun. I can't wait. Fantastic. Neither can I. Thank you again for taking the time. My and, pleasure. Uh, we'll be in touch very soon. Absolutely. See Thank you, mate. You,